Hi class, Dr. Nordstrom here. I'm going to be going over the occupational adaptation model with you. And in doing so, I want you to kind of think about how you are currently using components of this model in your life or how you can use this model to enhance your academic abilities, your work abilities, any of the roles that you have in your own life, I'd like you to think about how you can use occupational adaptation. Your parents have used it um, on you, or family or loved ones have, your coaches, your teachers, and they're doing it very innately, very automatically. Um, and what we're going to teach you is how, as an occupational therapist, you're going to use this particular model with your clients. So again, I've included a quote from the theorist that created this model, Schade and Schultz, and it says, occupation and adaptation are interwoven into an integrated phenomenon that describes the innate human process. What they're saying is that adaptation and, and occupation are used collaboratively throughout your life, and it's an innate part of all of us we all have a very unique way of adapting to things, and it's based on previous experience, learned experiences, your um, past experience will build your self-confidence to allow you to handle challenges differently. So prior to the class, um, I want to make one correction here because I realized it after the fact that um, you needed to read chapter eight in Cole and Tufano. Also, Willard and Spackman, I apologize. I think um, on the student PowerPoint, it has a different chapter. It has, I think, 44, which was the old version of Willard and Spackman and different material. So the current chapter for OA in Willard and Spackman is chapter 36. Both of these chapters, yes, give the same information, but they do it differently. So um, having both access to these will be very helpful. I think Willard and Spackman, they do a really nice job incorporating case studies throughout learning of this model, specifically to help you understand the different components of it. So one of the case studies is a 35-year-old female who is transgender, and it talks about that occupational adaptation and normative process with this transgender person. It also has a case study um, involving a 16-year-old with a diagnosis of spina bifida. Also, in the Willard and Spackman, which is the most recent, it actually has a table on page 595 regarding occupational um, adaptation guided assessments, which is different than what you have in the Cole Tufano. So remember, Cole Tufano is a little bit older, so their interventions and assessments um, are still pertinent. They're still appropriate but they give a little bit more in the Willard and Spackman, which is the most recent information, most evidence-based approach. So being able to utilize both of those is very helpful. Now I've also included in the model occupational adaptation. I know this is the original papers from Schultz and Skade, but they are phenomenal, um, not that long, and really quick and easy to read. So I'm going to just do a little summary, but again, you will find these in Module 4 that you can, um, I uploaded PDFs. So <clears throat> when looking at this, they split up the articles for a reason. So Part 1 is going to kind of talk about this OA originated as a frame of reference and it became a conceptual model. It really focused on a holistic approach and realizing that as occupational therapists, we are very diverse in areas. So we are, address mental health, we address phys dis, we address pediatrics. So it explains the process of occupational adaptation, that it's a basic framework. It goes over the concepts and assumptions, which is very similar to what the two chapters do. But what I like in here in the article too, it also comes right from the author, why and how this model is different than other ones that are on the market. And there's a huge difference that we'll get to when we talk about that. 
But again, it talks about how humans, they adapt to change because they want to participate in a specific occupation. There's that intrinsic drive. That occupational adaptation is a very normal, normative process. It's non-hierarchical. It's not stage-specific. It's a phenomenon. It emphasizes, and they use a lot with patient versus client, just so you know. So when you're reading this, you'll see more client, uh, patient, whereas in your text, you're going to see clients. But it talks about how the client will experience um, their self in relevant occupational contexts, and they want to make sure that the occupational therapist during interventions are consistent with creating um, unique occupational adaptation experiences because we all are at different stages and levels and very unique. It still correlates with the basic elements that it includes person, occupation, and um, environments and interaction, right? So those three components is huge. So that person is the desire for mastery. The environment is where it will take place, whether it's physical, social, cultural. And the occupation is that challenge, that press for mastery. I am going to emphasize specific words in this model as we go through the PowerPoint that when you see these words, you're going to automatically think OA. Okay, that's we're going to talk about how we make each of these theories and models different. How is OA different from OB and MOHO and EHP, right? It's the words, it's the terminology. So I am going to pinpoint those out for you and I'll tell you to star that because you want to almost on your templates which I probably should do um, for the ones coming up is the common terminologies the common terms because that's going to help you be able to understand questions if you're starting to see common terms in a question or quiz or how you want to talk with your clients when you're using this model so I'll point those out and just add those um, to your notes, star them so you can make sure you know. So in one of the, I'm only going to go over one for part one. It talks about a toddler and what I really liked, it explained the desire and the environment and then the social and cultural subsystem, right? So I'm sure you have done this, not just for a cookie, but for something else, right? There was a toddler who wanted a cookie and that was their desire. Their desire was to get this cookie. but there had cultural subsystems, right? So the cookie was only to be handed out by the parent when the parent thought it was appropriate. The parent is in another room working with another child. The toddler's looking and their environment is not really working to their advantage because the cabinet is too high for them. But the child does see a chair, which could also be a facilitator. And then that social subsystem is knowing that there's a parent and a child in that other room, right? So what is that child going to do? So the article goes through a series of um, examples. It has the toddler. It has a kindergartner um, talking about adaptive response. It has a sixth grader going over adaptive capacity, giving you an example of what each of these are. It talks about a 15-year-old making clothing, and that's going to address adaptive response modes. And then a 32-year-old with a career and family, I have to say that example correlated with my life so 100%, just the age was different. And that discusses relative mastery. So as you're going through these terms, you're going to realize, like, wait, what does this actually mean? Ideally, I'd love for you to create your own examples of each of the components of this model. But in the interim, these articles give you examples that you could then write next to them, you know, remember the toddler with the cookie or remember the 35-year-old um, trying to deal with work and home. And then those will help you understand the definitions. Part two goes over how do you use this um, the model to come up with interventions, right? Because the ultimate goal is to increase your patient's occupational adaptation process. So it's very different, but you want them to be able to adapt. Um, it's a neurological kind of component of adaptations. Like how are they going to cognitively or mentally adapt and then utilize it in their physical world. 
This too gives some examples. They stress the importance of the client being the agent and the therapist is the facilitator, facilitator and they do give some examples as well. So please make sure to really understand this model and prepare for your exams that you read through all of these and that you feel comfortable with them. And then I'm hoping my PowerPoints will provide you with any additional information that I was able to gather from both of these and then additional resources. So again, this model was published in 1992. Our authors for the textbooks have upgraded that content to bring it more to more modern times and more modern usage. It was originally introduced as a frame of reference, which you will find happens with some of our models. And then um, theorists decide, specifically Shade and Schultz were like, hey, you know, we agree with a lot of the terms in some of the other models, but we're not looking at things from a cognitive perspective. And what I mean by that is this particular model wants to see if they can have somebody adapt internal cognitive ad adaptations and solutions and resolutions and versus being able to physically make progress. So you do this internal at cognitive adaptive process change to then result in performing better. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Again, um, this model's focus is all ages and with a variety of diagnoses. This is a top-down approach. Again, really important to understand most of uh, our occupational therapy interventions are going to utilize that, where we look at that whole person, right? We fill out that occupational profile to understand everything. We don't just look at the diagnosis and only focus on the diagnosis and fix that diagnosis. That's a bottom-up approach. We look at who the person is, what stage of their life are they in? Is it pediatrics, adults, geriatrics? Um, what setting and, and milestone have they reached in their lives? What is their education? What is their social life? What is their home life? What is their physical setting? And then we look at what are their current capabilities. We include their client factors, their diagnosis as well, um, and then we go through that entire process. This is an occupational based model, so again we're looking at the overall participation in occupation. We want to make sure that when we're focusing on this particular model, there is a dis distinction between interventions as this particular model is focusing on improving adaptiveness versus functional skills. So this would go under your focus area. This is really crucial. I would star this. You will see this again, that the focus and the goal of this model is to improve your client's adaptiveness, ability to adapt to challenges that they will experience versus improving functional skills, meaning improving range of motion, um, improving strength, improving transfer status, okay? It's not really focusing on that. It's, it's improving the person's ability to adapt. It is very similar to other models as you will see in the chapters in the readings and the articles, right? And so it takes what those models offer and then takes it to a different level. But just like all these other models, we focus on roles, we focus on interests with the clients, we focus on that innate desire to um, do something, right? So that's a little OB, that's a little bit moho. You're gonna mo learn moho next um, week, but again, I'm trying to give you a little bit, some of the chapters, you know, in I think your intro to OT, you should have had a brief description of each of these. And then again, it's going to have its constructs, right? So every model has a construct and it has assumptions, it has dysfunction and function. And so here, we're looking at occupation and adaptation and how it interacts. So let's talk about some of the principles. Principles are fundamental truths of OA. So again, star number one, it's going to focus on adaptiveness rather than performance, rather than physical skills, okay? It's going to process, it's on a process rather than the outcome of new adaptive skills rather than performance. So what that means is that if somebody is faced with a challenge, we're looking at how is that person adapting, I don't want to just focus on cognitively, but it's a neuro approach. 
what is their skills to be able to adapt to that challenge for them to be successful? It will affect their performance at the end of the at the end result, but we're really looking at that initial processing ability to figure out how to overcome a challenge. Um, we all have a specific adaptive capacity that we are born with. And each occupation that you do on a daily basis, you're using so much of that capacity. And remember, when you learn something new, you're using up a lot of that adaptive capacity energy. And then when you become very familiar with it or used to it, it's something that you kind of do automatically so you're not using as much capacity. And we'll get into that. With this model, your client is the agent of change. Other models, you as the therapist are in charge of how to make change occur. This case, the client is, and then you are the facilitator. And what I mean by that is you're going to help the client figure out how to change and learn how to adapt better by using verbal questioning and specific tools to help someone achieve versus physically doing hand-over-hand assistance. We're going to teach the client um, how to learn how to problem solve, I guess, Uh, use their clinical reasoning, and then adapt. Because you can teach them one skill, but then what you want them to do is generalize that skill that when they go home and they have challenges, they're not going to depend on you. They're going to be able to use the resources you've taught them and to be successful. So you want to make sure that that client's able to make their own adaptations when participating in activities, specifically ones that are meaningful. It does have a model that's full of constructs and concepts, but again, we're always using that holistic and client-centered approach. These are the similarities between these models. Our ultimate um, approach is for health promotion, prevention, and remediation. And so this is another important thing because when we're looking at outcomes for our clients, which approaches are we using? And these are the three common ones that we're going to be addressing in this model. So I'm a visual person. I think Willard and Spackman did a nice job with also some visual graphs and explanations. I think Coltifano has just this grid only for a visual one. So I think that's why I like the Willard and Spackman one. But this is a chart you would recognize. So when you are, if you pick OA to work on your, let me just make sure that page is right. I have to adjust that. So I want to correct the page in the top left corner as well. That should read 109. So correct that on your PowerPoint. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at the three components up top and it's the person, it's the interaction, and then it's the occupational environment. So underneath each of those categories you need to, these are the terms you need to know for this model. Desire for mastery is in that person. That person wants to do something. That person, that child wanted that cookie and wanted to figure out how to get that cookie. That was their desire. So desire for mastery is an OA term and it should describe the person. We're going to go all the way to the right And that's occupational environment. And right below that is the demand for mastery. So in that toddler's environment, the demand for mastery was how am I going to get the cookie that is on the top of that counter? The counter was too high for me. But I saw a chair that I could grab, push across to the counter, climb on to the chair, then climb onto the counter. So again... There is that press for mastery, and what's impacting this child is the height of the cabinet, the location of the cookie, but there is something else that I can use to probably overcome that, but I'm not sure. And then that middle part is that occupational challenge, and it's how is that person going to interact with that environment, and that's where that child has to make that decision. One, do I want to disobey my mom and know that if I get this cookie, I'm going to get in trouble? Two, how am I going to get to that cookie? Am I going to use that chair? Is she going to hear me pushing that chair, right? So these are all of the challenges that this child is going through to decide what they want to do. So then you go down 
they're going to have a response. That child is either going to say, nope, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to wait and, you know, till I can earn it. Or that child is going to say, I'm going to push that chair. I'm going to go get that cookie. And then whatever happens afterwards is going to happen. And this is a, a, a cycle, right? So as you can see, it's kind of keep, it keeps going through as the person is constantly being exposed to challenges. So I need you to visually interpret this PowerPoint, I mean this picture, because if you are to do the model matrix at the end of the semester, you would include this as an example so that you picture OA, you close your eyes, you picture this um, picture, and this could possibly be put on an exam or a quiz as well. But then you get to see the terms. So OA has desire for mastery, press for mastery, demand for mastery. It has the occupational challenge. That's important. Highlight that. It has the occupational response. It has the adaptive response of our subcategories. And we'll get into that a little bit further on. And then it has that gestalt stage and that generation um, subprocess. So these are all words specifically used for OA, and it should say colon Tefano, page 109, not 141. So there are four main constructs that um, are observable and directly experience this phenomena, and it's occupations, right? So those are everyday activities that your client wants to um, participate in. It's their adaptive capacity, and then we're going to get into that a little bit more, understanding what does adaptive capacity mean, what are their abilities, their energy levels, their efficiency. And then it talks about relative mastery, and so that is going to be based on past experiences and their abilities to successfully adapt to challenges and be successful in their roles. And then it talks about the whole occupational adaptive process, which is the cyclical um, experience where you're faced with a challenge and the person has to determine how they're going to address that challenge. So let's break it down a little bit more. So for occupations, it's going to talk about, you know, how actively involved that client is, are the activities meaningful to that client, and you're going to include a process that may be tangible or intangible. Tangible means it's something you can physically touch and attain, or intangible might be more of like an emotion or um, a feeling of success. Okay, so both of those are going to be part of, of what's important and incorporate that occupation. So when you talk about adaptive capacity, that's that person, that client's ability to say, okay, I need a change, I need a modification, and I need to be able to adapt so I can be successful. So perfect example, it's a snow day today, right? So yesterday, I had to think about, okay, snow days are common, what are, what are my options? If there's a snow day today, how do I make sure that my students do not fall behind on their curriculum. So I'm either going to be coming in a little bit earlier because if there's snow, it's going to take me probably an extra 20 to 30 minutes to get to work and then to get to class. So instead of leaving for um, 8 o'clock, I should now leave for 7.30. So that would be my need for change. If there is a snow day, what are my options in getting this information to the students? One, I could do nothing and say, you know what, it's a snow day. Oh, well, we'll figure it out. Next week, we'll double up. And now I have to have you take, in three hours, two models at one time versus one. Two, I could say, okay, let's figure out how to do this, right? You already have the content. But now if I can provide you with the video, it's as if I'm there in person, right? And then we can address any additional questions or concerns in the next class, which wouldn't take up as much time. So I chose that as an option. But again, I needed to realize something needs to be done because today's schedule is, is altered. So my modification was providing you with, one, a notification of what's going to take place, two, creating the PowerPoint, and then uploading it for you so that you have to now watch this on your own time, but still learn and make sure you're able to get the same curriculum as if we didn't have a snow day.
right? So all of you are facing adaptive capacities throughout your entire lives with work, with as a sibling, as a child, as a student, as an athlete. However you have, you've done it. So you are either been exposed to it a lot or not exposed to a lot and you have developed your own routines on how to handle challenges. Some are not the best solutions and that's why we need to work on those and some of them are and just like our clients, if I had a new diagnosis of a CVA, my adaptive capacity to think about what I would do is going to be completely different now. I might have been able to have a sufficient relative mastery and sufficient adaptive capacity prior to my new diagnosis, but post my diagnosis, those skills might not be there. Again, it is a cumulative effect adaptive capacity, and it's based on what you've been exposed to in life. Remember, I have 20 plus years on most of you, so my 20 years of previous experience is going to allow my adaptive capacity to be possibly at a higher level than yours. Just like as you're learning as a student, oh my gosh, how am I going to be able to be a therapist? Same thing. You're going to go through the curriculum course with us and develop an adaptive capacity there. Then you're going to go through field work and develop an adaptive capacity there. And then you're going to start as a new therapist and develop an adaptive capacity. So it is over time. Again, the person's going to have a typical response and it might not meet that challenge, right? I might um, have a different view if my children were younger and I was not able to have alone time to record or if I had a power outage, I would not be able to record this curriculum. So there's many different things if I lost Wi-Fi. So that could possibly affect my ability to be successful and then I have to come up with alternative solutions for that to be competent in my output. So relative mastery means that that person has their own self-assessment of their abilities, of how they're going to do something. So we're going to talk about how is somebody efficient in their response. And when we talk about efficiency, this is where we talk about how much energy and time is being used for that client to be successful in their um in their roles and their occupations. We talk about effectiveness of a response, and this is going to be, did I achieve that goal that I, I went to achieve? So that one um, case study that it gave you in, oh goodness, one of the articles, I think it was the first part one, talked about that 35-year-old. And that 35-year-old was able to have um, efficiency and response. She was able to adapt to her environment. She was able to bring work home, but she messed up. She left stuff at work, so she had to come up with a new plan to get there early. Her husband was supposed to pick up an outfit specifically for this special day because she was doing a huge presentation at work. He forgot. So now she had to come up with a new outfit and iron, which took more time. So she was efficient. She ended up being effective. She was able to reach all of her goals. She got to work early. She was able to get the slides she missed. But she lacked in satisfaction. So she achieved everything. And on the outside, everything looked great. But her own personal satisfaction to how well she handled each of those things was not met. And so again, for someone to have relative relative mastery, you as the therapist might be like, yes, you did it, awesome job, you were able to achieve this goal for dressing, but the client might look at it like, well, it took me way longer than normal, I didn't do it as well as I used to, so that satisfaction might not be at the same satisfaction to you, so you need to keep that into consideration. This whole process, it takes a series of steps. It occurs whenever your client is faced with whatever challenges that occur during that occupation and whatever environment that person's in. It, the components that this model corresponds with is the person, it's the occupational environment, and then it's the interaction between that person and that environment. And then the process is going to be how that person can respond to adapting and mastering that occupation. 
So we're going to talk about that focus of that intervention. So again, on your template, you want to check your information, and I'll be looking at all of your templates that you uploaded in Canvas. Hopefully you got the announcement that those of you that did it and you hand wrote it, that you were going to show it to me in the beginning of class. If you could please take a screenshot of it, a picture of it, or scan it through a phone app and then upload it into Canvas so I can take a look at it to make sure that it was completed. I know that it was required to be in before 8.30 today. So those of you that wrote it by hand and then once you realized I have a day to sleep in and you slept in and now you're actually waking up and getting to look at some of your emails, that might not take place by 8.30 so you will not get a deduction, but please submit it by today so I can see it. It occurs across the lifespan it is a holistic application and it also deals with a variety of populations and therapeutic means. I also want you to include that the focus involves that it is the process of adaptation that you are improving for your client. Okay. As anything else, all of our models have some type of assumptions and these are broad statements. So I do still like how your textbook, your Colin Tofano will address each of these as well as give you a practical application. So it gives you what that um, assumption is and then it will break it down and it will tell you from a practical application. So for example, one of the assumptions um, is that um, you have a lifelong opportunity for adaptation as a person attempts to meet any type of internal and external needs when they're in their environment. So whenever a person responds to an occupational challenge, that's one's own internal adaptation process. So from a practical application, it says all occupations require some degree of adaptation, that internal process. Occupational therapists are going to recognize that when the clients are unable to engage competently in an occupation, it is due to that internal struggle with adaptation. So we're not looking at the physical reasons why somebody can't do something, but we're looking at why they're not able to internalize, right? So I had to internalize what would I do by the snow day impacting two huge courses for me, not only foundations, a three credit course, but this afternoon I have a huge course as well that those students had an email and I have to also record, but they have a lab component, so now I have to alter our schedule for next week. So I had to have an internal ability to process this and actually I had the foresight to talk to the students yesterday who were my second years in class and say, hey guys, if we have a snow day, this is what's going to happen, adjust your schedules. So I am the type of person that likes to have a plan B, a plan C, a plan D. I have to have, in my own personal life, have had so many altering challenges that have affected me emotionally, financially, and physically to now have prepared myself to experience the worst, prepare for the worst, so that I can be successful in anything that I do. So some of you who um, might not plan ahead might be like in that moment and then try to come up with um, a challenge. You're accustomed to that, right? And so your ability to internally process challenges is a very short amount of time to be able to do that. Some of us require a little bit longer time to do it and then some of us are like in the middle. I'm in the middle. I started off with very little time for my challenges to give myself and I had run into many problems in my life as far as tardiness, um, not getting things done that I should have, missing payments for bills because I held it off too long, right? So as I grew as a as a young adult, a teenager, into my adulthood, those challenges I now have different strategies for. So some of you will. There's no right or wrong um, if you are able to think ahead or not think ahead and able to plan. And But what is right or wrong is if you are unable to internally adapt to a challenge, right? So if somebody has, today's a snow day, and you might think, oh my gosh, what do I do? How do I turn, you know, i got to turn my assignments. What am I going to miss my work, right? So you're already processing. You have that internal processing going. But some of you are gonna might wake up and be like, oh, it's a snow day. I don't have to do anything. I'm going to just sleep in. I'm going to go maybe, I don't know, 
shopping and just do anything I want because it's not a school day. What is right or wrong is not what we're looking at. What we're looking at is what happens tomorrow or the following week when you had work that had to be done and now you're behind, right? So how do you adapt to those challenges at that moment? So that's what you have to consider. So the adaptation process, it can be disrupted. Most of your clients are gonna have this disrupted and this was the example I gave you. Um, if I was to have a stroke, what would happen? It could be to a new diagnosis, a new traumatic one, a disability, um, any type of handicap conditions, stressful events. It could be um, new challenges that you're faced with. It could be drastic weather, you know, environmental, COVID, right? Look at all that that did and all the adaptation required and challenges people had to face. Um, so again, there is reasons for this to get disrupted. So no matter how um, I might think I'm ahead of the game, something could have happened that could have limited me from doing any of this today and I'd have to think outside the box. So a person that has a desire to master, so wanting to do something for yourself as that person and then you have that environmental demand okay you put those two together you're gonna get your challenge and that's your occupational that's your depress um, demand press so again there's gonna be a set of demands or expectations for that behavior to be able to be successful so my press would have been how do I get the content to the students in a timely and efficient manner from missing my my desire my person was I am a professor my job is to make sure that module 4 is covered my environment was we now have a snowstorm which actually is not that big of a snowstorm FYI uh, probably could have had school it would have been challenging though for some of you that commute far but anyway that's a story for another day but my environment was school is closed there is no school there is no expectation to arrive and um, will not open until after 4 o'clock. Both of my courses were before 4 o'clock. So putting what my desire was and what my um, environment provided me with, I had to come up with a press and a solution and a uh, adaptive challenge was this video. So you want to make sure that there is improvement in occupational performance and that is dependent on someone's ability to have an adaptive process. So as my role as a professor was to make sure this curriculum was sent out to you, yes, you had the PowerPoints, yes, you could read the PowerPoints, you could read your own books, but my ability to take that content and relate it to your personal life, my personal life, clients, occupational therapy as a whole, you wouldn't have that exposure. You wouldn't have me reminding you, make sure you do these readings, which chapters were more beneficial and why, right? That interaction and collaboration from me to you to bring this content to the next level would have been hindered. So adapting also requires energy. What does this mean when it says energy is limited and finite? What that means is energy you are born with a certain level of energy and then that energy level is tapped into throughout your life and how much of it is tapped into depends on your current situations that you're going through so newer situations are going to tap into that energy level more it is unique to each person because it's based on what you've been exposed to throughout your life and then it um, depletes, so stress and diagnoses are going to deplete that energy level, just like as you can see when you're studying for an exam, right? If you have a lack of sleep, if you save things all to do at one time, you're gonna have limited time to do things. So all of this is understood, but we need to make sure that when we find that just right challenge for our clients, we're doing so to be able to preserve that adaptation energy. We want to make sure that we do not utilize it all at once on our clients and then, you know, tap them out. People, um, when we talk about their personal nature, 
it is something that's genetically embedded in you, right? Genetics play a huge role on who you are today, what you have become, what you've just innately um, have in you, okay? You can have three different siblings, and one, we have a type A, a type B, and then, you know, a very chilled person, all very successful, all from the same parents, but their genetic makeup is different. Your environment, um, is it a facilitator or is it a barrier for you? And how is that going to impact your ability to accept and adapt to challenges? Your experience, again, your age, your exposure to personal work, academic experiences is going to impact who you are as a person. We talked a little bit about this in ProCom 1, right? How you are taught or how you are told who you are. Um, you know, you might be informed you're not a great test taker. You don't handle stress well. Well, guess what? If that's what you're exposed to on a regular basis, that negative input, you won't be successful. So your experience can be who you um, have as role models. They could be positive. They could be negative. Your siblings, your friends, your significant others, um, how are they impacting you? Um, what experiences have you been exposed to with them? Your environment is going to talk about your physical environments, your physical components, your home, your desk, your school, your situation, your driving, your commute, whatever it is. Um, your social context is who you involve yourself with in those environments. And then your cultural, those belief systems. Um, we have a motto. Um, and it's a sign in our house, work hard, play hard, right? So you work your hardest and you'll be rewarded at the end from that, you know. And again, however you are brought up, um, some of the stories talked about culturally, different roles based on genders in a home. Um, being able to be first generation, you are defying that cultural context. You are defying that experiential phenomenon that you've had in your family, and so you might be setting the bar because your limited experience um, of having someone prior to you doing that. So in that case, that's going to cause you to use up a lot of your energy because you're going to be making some mistakes along the way, but then you will achieve it. So when challenges occur, we want to know what our clients' roles are, what are their expectations and their demands for that, right? So remember we talked about success is completing a task, but what is their true success? And then what is their inherent drive? You know, each of us have three different subsystems. When we talk about that drive for mastery, it's really important that that's who we are as a person. We're looking at that internal personal component. And then what is that person's sensory motor capabilities? What are their cognitive capabilities and what are their psychosocial capabilities at the time that you're working with them in therapy? You can learn about prior to coming and prior to the diagnosis they were completely independent in all these areas, but now currently what are we demonstrating? And then incorporating everything else, that diagnosis, that genetics, that environment, and that learned process. Um, we also want to make sure that that person is able to understand that feedback from that environment, Okay, that child realizing I can't reach that cabinet, right? Realizing that if he tries, that feedback is going to be unsuccessful. But then um, what else is in the environment to help me become successful? If you're that determined to get something, um, what are you going to do? Um, and then that these systems are going to enforce occupational response. So in one of the articles, it talked about a young lady who was so excited she was going to be a seamstress. She wanted to make something. And her mother wasn't available and, and was going to help her and bought with her own money this material. So she really didn't want to mess up the material because it was expensive. And she was so, her, her inner internal processing was like, where is mom? She's not here. I want to do this and I want to do this right now. And she had to make an executive decision of can, do I just cut it and just wing it and figure it out or, or do I wait for my mom because I might waste the material, right? So this could be in so associated with some impulsivity that you might see with your clients is their ability to process, um, their internal process skills are, are lacking and they're making poor judgment. 
So again, this would be a great model to utilize for someone who needs to work on those skills. So again, like any other model, we talk about what's function versus dysfunction. So someone that is able to function, they're able to engage and perform in occupations that are in specific environments, and they're able to master and accomplish them. So remember, sometimes in one environment, you're able to achieve a task. Right? You're in class, you have your professor there, you have your notes, you're able to answer or ask any questions you want. But then when you go back um, another day or two later and you go to review that material, you don't have the professor there to inquire about or maybe you didn't have all of the books with you when you went to go travel for that weekend so you don't have the content to refer back to are you able to still master that material and then what is your ability to adapt for that specific situation so someone that is functioning can meet their roles their expectations they can master um, and be able to adapt and be competent to meet the standards. They're a healthy person that is able to show adaptive capacity and relative mastery. Those last terms as well highlight adaptive capacity and relative mastery because those are part of this specific model itself. Dysfunction is when a person is not able to show that they are competent and complete an activity or occupation because there is some type of disruption in the capacity, their adaptive capacity. We're not looking at physical, remember, we're only looking at their ability to adapt because sometimes they might be able to talk it out and then come up with a resolution on how to do something and that's what we're looking for. This can occur because a person's ability to adapt has now been challenged to the point that the demands for the performance are not satisfactorily met. So even though somebody has completed something, it's not to their satisfaction, so that's considered dysfunction in their, in their eyes. And then again, um, any type of faulty mechanism within that person or environment, their inability to um, pick or uh, how to do something differently and change. We're also going to use at the end of this, um, it's not on your PowerPoint, but it's on mine. We're going to relate this to Wendy to see how this kind of makes sense and applies to her as your case study. So this whole process now we're going to talk about is that somebody's going to have a desire to master something. So healthy individuals, they're going to want to master it by meet, meeting that personal capacity for sensory motor, cognitive, and psychosocial. A dysfunctional pattern means that that desire might be unrealistic and that person is not able to adapt or respond appropriately. So this is how you're able to see function and dysfunction in that desire for mastery. So for that demand for mastery, that person is going to be able to work and participate and engage in occupations no matter what environment. This particular model, remember, was created in 1992, so they specifically talk about work, play, leisure, self-care, and maintenance. As you know, we have many other occupations to add to that, but these were the primary three when this model first came out. That environment is going to create its own criteria for successful occupational performance. So someone that is functioning is able to meet those demands. Someone that is dysfunctioning is not able to um, create their own set of criteria to be successful. So I gave you an example on the bottom that the OT program, we have to meet specific eight code standards. Then these standards are what create our curriculum, our content, and then they're going to trickle down to you as a student. And then as a student, you have to demonstrate a specific degree of competency and mastery in the content to be able to graduate. So your competency is, is assessed throughout each course with um, assignments and quizzes and exams. Your exams, is, especially maybe that last one, not for every course, is a exam that might be cumulative to assess your overall competency and then maintaining that GPA and then moving on. So when we have our challenges, it does impact us, it does affect us in a way, and so that's what we're going to take a look at now. So when we have our roles of a specific environment, then we have to be able to shape our behavior and how that's going to impact our occupation. So for example, um, each person below, there's three names, they have an, an internal set of standards. This is what 
what is considered a good student to them. So Tom feels that by being a good student, he's very organized, he has everything planned out in a planner, knows when everything is due. James considers himself to be a good student because he ends up studying every day. Every single content, designated times, he stays with it and sticks with it. And then Nick, his biggest reason why he thinks he's a good student is because he's achieving the grades that are required to be successful. So all of their three different people, three different views on their own internal standards of being a good student. And then the external expectations, right? So that's that's the person, that's who they are. Then the external expectations, that environmental expectations is the college, the department of OT, what do we consider to be a good student? And one of those is being able to achieve um, an 80 or above each semester, right? <coughs> Excuse me. There's other ones. I'm just picking out one that we're looking at. And so Nick has to adapt to reach that, <laughs> excuse me, James, same thing, and Tom. So they have to meet those external expectations to be able to adapt and make sure that their methods are reaching those goals. So again, change in motivation. This is on your template. Just grabbing a drink. And again, we're looking at that person for the desire of mastery. The environment is the demand for mastery, and the press is that occupational challenge. And those are going to impact motivation and change. What else will impact it is that we find something that's meaningful and desired to the client. We make sure that the demands of the occupation are manageable, that our client is able to handle that and are within their ability to adapt so that we provide the just right challenge. And those outside forces, those challenges that um, come from the environment is going to equal what that person can handle. So assessments. As far as assessments, we want to make sure that we always incorporate that occupational profile, right, to get to know that person, that top-down approach. We also want to make sure we can determine our client's strengths and weaknesses, specifically correlating to that person, their sensory motor, their cognitive, and their psychosocial. Because we're looking at an adaptive cognitive processing skill, cognition is a component that we want to make sure that this is an appropriate model to utilize with our client. So we need to measure their you know, physiological capabilities, their psychological, neurological, and their intrinsic aspects. We also want to analyze the roles that that client is hoping to be able to return to. We want to make sure that we can tell that their ability to perform an activity will be able to meet those roles to allow for their ability to master. And so we're going to use a series of standardized assessment tools and even some non-standardized, to be honest with you, we can be able to use both because observation is also key. So we're going to learn from our clients, we're going to inquire, we're going to interview, we're going to um, assess and act. So I also wanted to show you that OA has a specific, oh fudge, you know what, that's no longer, I'm sorry guys, I should have made these changes. Ignore page 534. That is not the case anymore for Willard and Spackman. But um, I provided you with an appendix, and these are specific questions that, as an occupational therapist, you're going to be looking at to see how your client is doing from an occupational adaptation process. So let's just start with the left side. All right, so when we're working with our client, one of their assessment tools is considered data gathering assessments. So we're gonna ask them what are their roles and what environments they participate in. What's their role in their family or at work? And what performance is expected to be able to complete that role? What are the physical, social, and occupational components to it as well as cognitive and psychosocial? Um, what makes, what's their current relative mastery, right? Are they in that primary role, primary occupational environment and role? 
And then um, do they have a good sense of being able to master? Do they have decreased confidence in their self and all of that? We're going to take a look at. So these are questions you would ask. Um, what's their readiness? So you can already see when you're evaluating someone and you're putting them in, in challenging situations, how are they going to adapt to that? Are they going to say, I don't want to do this anymore, stop it? And that's a sure sign of like, okay, is it because they don't know what to do next? Are they feeling successful or not successful? Um, what's the best method to be able to engage and have our client participate? What's their energy level? So one of the books, both of the books actually, talk a little bit about um, that energy being effective in participation, and that's based on, well, how someone feels or they're able to achieve their goals. So someone, depending on their diagnosis and their psychological component at that time, could be very low level, and, and you have to then have them have small baby progress steps to improve that. You also want to determine what is their efficiency, right? So we want to look at what resources somebody has. Um, so if I needed to, my resources was required Wi-Fi service whatsoever and a, my laptop, and to make sure I had all the tools here, so every book I required, everything I had asked of you, all the articles I had so I can review over before I present in class. And I always read everything over every year so it's fresh in my memory, but also to make sure that I'm up to date with everything, right? So what are my ability to have resources readily available? Same thing with your client. What is their energy, their time, the different materials you're going to be using, and what are their social supports? Okay, so this is a guide that we're going to use to be able to evaluate our client. So our goals is, of course, to allow them to have that internal adaptive response improved. We want to make sure that we use our therapeutic use of occupation so that we can promote adaptation. We want to make sure that we learn when to push and when to hold back from our clients because remember they're the agents. So we really want them to initiate most of the interventions. We want to be able to facilitate in therapy with the use of it more from a verbal perspective and possibly pointing things out with our client but making sure that they realize that they're in charge as well as maybe facilitate with the actual environment um, that we suggest. For steps, we want them to carry out the specific activities within the roles that they find most important for them to achieve at that time. And I think in the second article, it, it gives you, it talks about a client that's a client A and a client B, and they both have um, physical limitations, but their roles are very different in what are priorities for them. So that means using the OA model for each of them is going to be very different. Right, um, one wanted to be able to return to work and so forth, and depending on their diagnosis, what those capabilities are versus maybe home, home maker role. So again, you need to figure out well what's causing this person not to be able to achieve those goals. Um, what is that external environment that's facilitating or inhibiting more really, or is it a personal internal component of the client that's inhibiting success? So you have to look at the person and the environment um, all together. So here we have a video, and this video was um, I found on the web, and it actually talks about the role and expectations of a client. So the therapist is um, in front of the computer, and then the patient is to the right. And these are occupational therapy students, so they took this model and created their own video. And they're going to interview this client to determine what are their demands for mastery and the desire for mastery. The volume fluctuates, so I'm hoping it's going to record OK for you. So let's see what happens. Um, I will also post this video in Module 4 in case you're having any issues hearing it. Okay, so I'm actually going to post the video, which I'm kind of bummed about right now, but because this is a PowerPoint and I'm recording it, I can't... Um, uh, that's a bummer. So I will put it um, in the module, but I will explain to you what happened. So the young lady to the right 
is in a very serious car accident and she is a student and um, is a family member and is then told by the physician that she is um, has a spinal cord injury and she will be paralyzed from the waist down. So her world, her life, and her mind has changed dramatically and the occupational therapist comes in to provide her with empathy and therapeutic use of self to determine what are her primary roles that she wants to return to and to provide her with that just right challenge so that she can direct her course of intervention And it is learning how to maneuver around her home and community now in a wheelchair because she's unable to use her legs, which means her ability to access cabinets and shelving is going to be with adaptive equipment to be able to reach. And then her ability to return to school um, as a student. And they kind of go through that whole process and they use the terms for OA as well as each of the stages so it's a nice video to kind of follow along so let's talk about Wendy we're just about into an hour in so we're almost done here but let's think about her and utilizing the occupational therapy um, adaptation model so we're gonna want to know what specific information would you want to ask her in her occupational profile what might you want to know about her environments What are Wendy's facilitators and barriers? What are her roles? What interventions might you want to pick in order to address her barriers? So I want you to just take a few minutes, take a piece of paper. I'm going to give you um, two to three minutes right now so that you can answer these questions and then we're going to, I'm going to provide you with the answers. I really want you to be able to use the terminology from OA that you just learned and um, desire um, desire to master right utilizing those occupational press relativity relative mastery sorry Um, press for mastery demand for mastery all those terms so go ahead and then I'll come right back in two minutes Okay, so some of these we've already discussed in class, but we're going to now apply them. So hopefully these are some of the answers you wrote down. Um, oh, we'll get it. I'm sorry, we're going to ask some more questions. What specific information would you want to ask in her occupational profile? So here, what is Wendy's occupational history and experience? These are the questions you would ask. What is her ADL routine, her pattern? Are you able to do it on your own? What does it consist of? What occupations does she need or want or expected to perform, right? So some of the things that she needed to do was she was required to work. She was required to have specific duties at the um, residence where she stayed, the group home. And then at her job, she had specific criteria to perform. 
wanting them and needing them are two totally different things, right? So things that she wanted to do was um, work to make money. She needed she needed to work to make money. She wanted that money to be able to then um, afford, you know, being able to take care of her sister financially and all that. But what she really wanted was more to become that author, that writer, um, watch her show when she wanted. So her needs and wants varied, and it changed her personalities. Her roles was um, a sister, an aunt, an employee, an author, a dog mom, and then a resident and a friend at the group home. What does she like to do? What were her hobbies, her interests? So we kind of talked a little bit about that already. And then there's um, knitting. I forgot to mention knitting and photography, right? So she loved to take those pictures um, and have those as visual cues as well or maintain the pictures and kind of store them on her wall. So that was something. What were her desires to master? So her desires to master, the first one that comes to mind probably is her ability to submit this paper, right? Everything was based on that. And then depending on what happened, and to go home, right? She, her desire was to get the money to help provide for her sister and niece and her brother-in-law and to go back home to them. That was all she wanted. Um, her problems had to do with self-regulation, transitions. Um, she had sensory motor problems where she was overstimulated. She had cognitive problems, um, inabilities to remember, but she set up strategies and psychosocial. What were her priorities? Okay, so priorities were um, home and getting to that submitted. And then when those changed, it was um, creating money to provide for her so that she can go where she needed to. Okay. So some of the roles hopefully you picked for her was that she's a sister-in-law, aunt, dog owner, employee, friend, and a main character. I forgot to talk about this in the Star Trek paper. Her occupations were self-care, working at the donut shop, different responsibilities there, her resident chores, taking care of Pete, walking and dressing him, um, leisure, she enjoyed the show, she enjoyed writing and knitting and being those. So if I give you a second, I kind of am going through this with you, I'll give you a second to think of these and then I'll provide you with the information. And you would do these questions on your own personal clients. And so Wendy's your personal client right now, so that's why we're utilizing her. But this is how you would apply this model to your evaluation and your assessment. So who are her facilitators? Okay, I think Scotty, I think the charge resident, there was a Madeline there. You didn't really see a lot of her. You heard her name mentioned. I think Frank, I think we talked about the biggest facilitator. I think Frank came in pretty quickly, but I really think Scotty was her probably first person and Madeline because she saw her the most. Her notebook was a huge facilitator. It provided her with cognitive remediation techniques. Her schedule being written down by that Mira, but then realizing that she had done it so many times, right? So that ability to have an introduction and use up all that energy was decreased by having the visual cues but was re-emphasized and reinforced so that when she didn't have the visual cues when she was on her own she could repeat everything that whistle to provide her with okay somebody I know is coming which means I need to stop what I'm doing and respond the lady that she met from the senior center was a huge facilitator in the sense that you know she caught the gentleman trying to take advantage of her for money she wanted her to come with her and really was promoting her and actually trying to set her up with her grandson. <laughs> and then Nemo, I think, um, being that friend and making her that CD and showing her, you know, if you care about somebody and you're, you're invested in them, you know, you do nice things for them. Some of her barriers were the difficulty with her being able to be touched, whether it was physical or social or cultural. Her difficulty with eye contact, and again, that was, that's, a lot of these are 
because of her diagnosis um, that we are aware of, and then that's why we have to develop these internal processing abilities to ad adapt to these challenges. And so some of this was also utilizing that whistle and that external hug, right? Scotty created those as um, that press for mastery, it was done alternatively, but she could still be successful. Her ability to socialize, she took things very concretely. Um, her memory, difficulty with transitions, so um, really when that sister first came and told her no, that she wasn't going to come, and that was a huge blow to her heart and to her mind cognitively. Her inability to manage her, her anger, her frustration, right? She didn't have those, her ability, adaptive capacity was very limited at that time and she ended up self-inflicting pain and discomfort on herself and then that external cue of um, please stand by needed to be provided by Scotty because she couldn't do it herself. Money management, um, her diagnosis, her street skills, those were all big. So as an OT, you want to make sure that you're going to, that occupational readiness to increase Wendy's ability to participate in occupations. So you want to help her adapt to self-regulating her emotions. So her inability to adapt to transition was noted very early into the show. And even as a child, when the, her sister went back in time, she saw her hitting herself, holding herself. Um, and those are, those are dysfunctional adaptation responses, right? So she needed to learn the new one, which was please stand by. So her roles, she, um, you want her to follow the residential rules. You want her to be able to get dressed before going downstairs. So during an occupational therapy session, now this is what could have been done prior to Wendy being who she is. Um, Wendy might say, I, I want to watch my favorite show that starts in 10 minutes. So you, as the facilitator, are going to say, what are the rules to be able to go downstairs? And then she's going to say, I need to get dressed. And then I don't know what to wear. So then you're going to say, and I made all this up. But again, this is you being a facilitator, allowing Wendy the opportunity. You don't physically get her the clothes. You don't physically do anything. You are cognitively trying to seek her ability to improve her adaptiveness to challenges, right? So I need to get dressed, but now she doesn't know what to wear. So then the occupational therapist might say, well, what day of the week is it? And that will trigger Wendy to look at the schedule. And she said Monday, so then she's going to look at the schedule and she's going to see that she wears a red sweater and jeans on Monday. Again, we're not taking physically doing anything. We're allowing Wendy to learn these adaptation skills. So um, other things that we want to see her do is she's now able to get dressed in a controlled manner without any emotional or physical outbursts. These are our, our responses we're looking to achieve. She's able to adapt and show self-initiation with verbal questions. Um, she's the agent of her change. She's able to problem solve what to wear each day. And that, that strategy could have been something that Wendy created with the therapist. You know, we don't have that ability to know, but that would be a strategy you could use going forward with clients who struggle with memory and creating a schedule. So hopefully some of these answers and this client will influence your therapy in the future. Well, the approach focuses on the client's internal need. A root. So for her, she is very routine and having something that's familiar to her. So any approach that we're going to use, we know that about her. So we're going to incorporate that. And then her external environment needs is that it should be a clean outfit each day. But of course, um, I think, th and I think she adapted to the shower, but she had a new outfit scheduled for her. And a written schedule was utilized as a modification to allow for successful adapting. And then she was able to generalize this modification, right? When she was on her own, she was able to then utilize please stand by on her own. She was able to utilize the schedule routine on her own by recalling it. And she utilized her notepad for anything she couldn't remember. Okay. So the one thing I do want to add, we are done now. I will add that video for you to watch. But I also want to ask you in the Willard and Spackman on page 595, 
there is a list of occupational adaptation guided assessments and there's one two three four five six seven and it gives you the names and then the overall purposes of them so those would be added to the assessments your other book um, colon Tofano lists um, not specific, you know, using the occupational profile and then those specific questions, but then these can also be added. So I hope that you're able to enjoy the rest of your day. I hope that utilizing my personal examples, you as a student examples, and Wendy allow you to see the importance importance of this model and how it is completely different from the others as it is dealing with the process of occupational adaptation. And then once somebody is able to use that process and know how to adapt, right? So in the video, the client is unable to reach and she has to think about, okay, how can I go ahead and reach to get plates or whatever I need out of the cabinets or fridge because now I'm in a wheelchair. And she was taught how to reach things off the floor with the reacher. She's now going to take that reacher. So she's using the adaptation process of utilizing something for one thing and now utilizing it for something else. So this is by far one of my, this is my favorite model. And then my next favorite is PIOP. But um, hopefully you're seeing this at a different perspective. And make sure you get your OA templates submitted. And thank you for watching this, and I will see you next week. We're going to be working on Moho, so I will post the Moho PowerPoint, as well as make sure the chapters are correct, um, and they are on your syllabus. I don't know. I have to fix the ones on the slides. But take care.